Okay, thank you, Paolo. Um, so one thing that I noticed is that you guys are really paying very close attention to everything I'm writing. So several of you pointed out some of the errors I made on the formula. So I thought I'd start uh, in the Rata Corrige uh, section on this side of the board. So I made one mistake writing down the invariant distance in the seed there. For those of you that have written that formula, there is no square here. It's easy to see because at least it has to be invariant under dilations, okay? So only tau tau prime, not tau square. And the other thing I realized, maybe I, since my handwriting is not as good as LaTeX, uh, that I wasn't making a clear distinction between this curly R that, I consider, that is the letter that I use for <coughs> primordial curvature perturbations, the one that originated the, the whole distribution of matter in the universe and the CMB. This is what I'm going to introduce later today in a gauge invariant way, etc. Sometimes maybe this gets confused with the capital R, which is just appearing in the Einstein-Hilbert action as the Ricci scalar. Okay, so most of the time, actually, this would be the R. I'm going to try to make it curlier from now on, but I hope that this doesn't confuse you. So every time R appears in a correlator, I'm always talking about this. In fact, most of the rest of the lecture, R will always be this variable. Okay, the primordial curvature perturbation, and we will see what they are. Okay, well, so we are going to uh, pick up exactly from where we, <coughs> we left the story. So what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of the lecture, talk about slow roll. And I know that many of you already know this story, but I'm going to try today to do it in a way that hopefully is slightly different from the way you saw it. So please don't, don't fall asleep right away. I'm going to talk about Hubble's slow roll parameters and potential slow roll parameters. And then I was debating a little bit whether this should be taught at the school, but I think Quite some people are working on multi-field, also given that single field inflation has been so much studied. And I think in the literature, I don't know, a single paper, including my own, in which multi-field potential slow roll parameters have been written correctly. So I just thought the school is the best way to, to try to, to fix that mistake. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about what happens if we do inflation with more than one field. And then finally, I'll start... Uh, kind of the sexier part, sexier part of the lecture with perturbation theory. That's where you use really quantum mechanics and curve space time to predict the distribution of things in our universe. Uh, and finally, I'll tell you what this R is by the end of the lecture. Very good. So where we left was a theory uh, with a scalar field coupled to gravity. And we computed the, the two relevant equations to describe the background. One is the Friedman equation, and the other is the equation of motion for the scalar field. Uh, the Friedman equation just looks very, uh, very familiar. It's just 3h squared and Planck squared equal energy density. I'm assuming the universe is spatially flat. And this one looks uh, also familiar, except that there is this Hubble friction term. Um, so the whole reason why we got into this business was that we were trying to find a phase in the early universe that looks like the sitter. So what does that mean? It means that it's approximately a metric like this. And if it were exactly the sitter, this parameter here, h, Maybe it's also useful to rewrite this metric using, com uh, uh, using cosmological time, just as a reference. Uh, this would be the metric. This parameter h is exactly constant in the sitter. Now, we already said we don't want it to be exactly constant. Otherwise, the sitter phase uh, is infinitely long. So it is clear that we're going to have to have some h dot, so the, the time de derivative of h, uh, that is non-zero, okay? Because otherwise, if it is zero, it's always the sitter. And in some sense, we don't want this to be so big, right? If it is big, we are very far away from the sitter. Now, in physics, we try to always avoid saying that some dimensionful quantity is small or larger because that's meaningless. So we are going to divide this one by h squared to make it uh, dimensionless. Very good. Uh, and then it's always fun to work with things that are most of the time positive. So I'm going to put a minus sign in front of it. You can just take it as a definition. And I'm going to call this thing epsilon. And this is the first Hubble's slow roll parameter. Hubble's slow roll. Hopefully the reason why it's called Hubble parameter is obvious. This thing doesn't know anything about... Uh, what kind of matter is sourcing uh, the expansion of the universe. This is only knowing about gravity. It's only knowing about space-time. It's only taking uh, derivative of geometric quantities like, uh, like Hubble. And first, because there is only one derivative, and it's the first one I introduced. Okay, so there is some sense in which we want this one to be much smaller than one, right? To be close enough to the sitter. That's going to be the first condition. <coughs> 
Um, actually, this is a kind of a, a fun parameter to introduce. In fact, you can rewrite the acceleration condition that you get from Einstein equation. Uh, usually it looks something like this. Now I shouldn't have written this out of what I remember because I probably don't get it right. But so that one I'm not 100% sure, but I'm sure that this thing is written as h squared 1 minus epsilon. Okay, this is the acceleration condition. So it's obvious that acceleration, which is what we want, uh, right? We, we said we have a couple of reasons why we want an accelerating universe, is the same as epsilon smaller than 1. I have some signs, right? Epsilon is more than one. Very good. Uh, yeah, because if it is bigger than one, then this is negative. Very good. Um, and in particular, let me just mention the obvious thing that epsilon equals zero means that we are exactly in the city. Um, okay, so this one tells me that a certain instant of time, um, well, we might have been uh, close enough to the seat there, but one moment later, it could be that this function changes very quickly. So I want to avoid that. So I want this epsilon to be small for some amount of time. Why is that? Because we observe more than one, just one scale. We observe a lot of scales. We observe at least uh, the, the maximal cosmological scale that we observe divided by the minimal one is of order of maybe 10 to the 3 or maybe 10 to the 4. So if I want to take a log of this, because usually I like to de define this in terms of e-foldings, that means the natural logarithm of this quantity. This is of order of 8, 80 foldings. And over this whole range of scales, from the largest scales in the CMB to the smallest one, and the same in large scale structure, I see this approximate scale invariance. So scale invariance was coming from being close to the sitter, so I want to be close to the sitter not just at one instant in time, but for some prolonged amount of time. So I'm going to have to ask that not only epsilon is small, but also its variation in time is small. So I take the time derivative of epsilon. I would like that to be small, but that's a dimensionful quantity, so I divide it by h to get it dimensionless. And I want it to be small with respect to epsilon itself. Okay, so the fractional variation of epsilon is small, and I can call that one a name. I'm going to call it seconds of roll parameter. Hubble parameter, of course. Coming from the first Hubble parameter. Um, let me just point out that there is another convenient way of writing these things in terms of another variable that I call the number of e foldings. This is equal. In, in differential forms, it's just the, the, D of, uh, the, the, the differential of the logarithm of the scale factor. Maybe more uh, uh, evocatively, this is just the logarithm if you integrate this quantity of the scale factor at the end over the scale factor at the beginning. Okay, we call this one uh, e number of e-folding. So or maybe for short sure, e-folds. Uh, okay, by its own definition, which is dA over A, I can use uh, all the, the fun chain rules that I get to use in cosmology. So this is dA over A, which is uh, dA over dT, dT over A, and this is just H dT. So in particular, I discovered that this quantity is the same as uh, dN of epsilon over epsilon. Okay, so sometimes maybe it's easier to, to write it like that. And in fact, because of that analogy, I could define an infinite series. So another way is that eta is just the, the derivative with respect to the number of e-foldings of the log of epsilon. So it's a very compact notation. And since this looks so compact, I might just keep going. Let me define another slow roll parameter, which you could say maybe is the third one, to be, again, the logarithmic, the end derivative of the log of the previous one. And so I can go, go on infinitely. Okay, this is just definition, not so important. Probably the first two are the only one that I mentioned, but I just want to show you the structure. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to ask that these are all small. And maybe the intuitive reason is because this guarantees that the space-time looks like uh, the sitter for a long time. But maybe a little bit more in formula, uh, let, let's write uh, 
this in another way that is maybe, well, for me it's evocative, at, at least when I think about this, that's how I think about it. So let me take epsilon as a function of n, just because the algebra is simpler than as a function of t, and Taylor expand it around some fixed uh, uh, number. So the number of e-folding now is parameterizing time. So I can Taylor expand it. And we all know how to do a Taylor expansion, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm just pointing out, so let's collect this epsilon of uh, evaluated as some fixed value. And notice that here what appears is dn of epsilon divided by epsilon. That's, that was my definition of eta, right? And here what's appearing, the second derivative. So I'm going to take this one and divide it by the first derivative and multiply by the first derivative. And then divide it by epsilon and multiply by epsilon. So this becomes uh, eta psi 3 n minus n star square plus dot, dot, dot. So in some sense, all that infinite series of slow roll parameter, Hubble's slow roll parameter, is really what, tell, what is telling me how epsilon evolves with time, or if you want, with e-foldings. Now imagine that all of these parameters, uh, they are so small that uh, after some amount of e-foldings delta n, this is still much smaller than 1. Then this quantity is going to be smaller than the first one, and so will be the second, and so on and so forth. Then from this, it's easy to see that I can think of, uh, of eta to be 1 over uh, delta n tot. So eta is, is in some sense is what's telling me how long inflation goes. So this is very, very rough, of course. And I got it from Taylor expanded. When, when I weight a certain number of e-foldings of order 1 over eta, the second term will be, uh, will be of order 1, and this expansion is breaking down. So probably epsilon is, is, gonna, is, is growing, is growing large. Okay, so that, that is going to be close to the end of inflation. This is just for intuition. You don't have to think about it like this. Intuition. We will see in a second that you can be more formal, but this, this helps me. So in general, if you want to do calculations where epsilons or eta appear inside time integrals, it's always useful to ex tailor expand them. And so at least you know the things you're dropping at what order in slow roll they appear. Some questions about this? questions, yeah? yeah. It shouldn't diverge because epsilon is, uh, is positive definite. And we're not going to have uh, bounces in which, uh, yeah, in which is going through zero. Is it going through zero? No. Well, this is never going to be zero. Actually, typically what happens in a typical inflationary model, but I'll show you this a little bit later, is that epsilon is going to grow with time. Uh, so typically it starts small, eventually it's of order 1, and usually that's where inflation ends. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's not a problem. I mean, you might have cases in which some of these uh, diverge, that maybe you have to be careful, but... Do you have a question? I'm so, yeah. uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Did you no, what I said is that when, after a certain number of e-foldings of order 1 over eta, then the corrections to epsilon start being, being bigger than epsilon, and so you're probably close to the end of inflation. So very roughly, you can take that as to be the zero order approximation of how long inflation is going to be. In practice, you really have to take this function and see when it's one. 
but I was trying to give you some intuition on the meaning of these low roll parameters. If any one of them is anomalously large, that term eventually is going to overcome the, the initial value, and that, that is going to make epsilon go to 1, and that's when inflation will end. So in some sense, this, the largest one of these low roll parameters is going to make inflation end eventually, assuming that this is an analytic function, etc. But this is just intuition, okay? So that there is a... This is the way I think about it. I don't know if it is useful for everyone. Otherwise, you can just take the definition. And that's good. Okay, potential zero roll parameters. In some sense, this, uh, this Hubble parameter, what I want to stress is that one is they are only written in terms of uh, uh, geometric quantities, only Hubble. As long as you know Hubble as a function of time, you can compute them all. And I didn't assume anything about how many scalar fields or even if they were scalar fields. They just know about the, the, the geometry, and they don't know about what is sourcing this expansion or this accelerated expansion. So they have a very universal character. There are other slow roll parameters that you can define that do not have a universal character. They are much more related to this specific example, and those are the potential slow roll uh, uh, parameters. Since they are widely used and useful in certain situations, I'm going to introduce them as well. So suppose that you have this intuition that... Uh, that the given potential V of phi is going to resemble a constant, well, if it is very flat, if it is, in fact, if it is exactly flat, that the thing is exactly a constant. So you might uh, very tentatively try to define quantities that have to do with the derivatives of this phi. And now you might not find any reason to define these, but at least these are dimensionless quantities. And then you could try to define these quantities as they are often defined. And at this point, there is no reason why I'm defining them, but it will be clear in a second why, uh, why you should define them. And then you can define, you can go crazy. Uh, triple derivatives. These parameters, the first thing that I want to tell you is that they do not know about the dynamics. They only know about the property of V. But the property of V are, of course, not sufficient to find the solution of this differential equation because this is a second order differential equation, so it takes two initial conditions. So you still need to specify those two initial conditions to know the solution. Okay? What the, the only thing that they, those parameters know about is the shape, is V, the functional dependence of V. The reason why they're very useful is because there is a regime in which these Hubble's low roll parameters that to compute, you should solve the whole dynamics, are approximated by these potential low roll parameters. So they're very useful as an approximate way to compute the Hubble's low roll parameters. And in fact, that's very easy to see. Let me take um, the Friedman equation. Yeah. And then I claim that that equation can be written in this form. And maybe you can, you can try to prove this uh, and to prove it. You uh, will have to use the fact that... Uh, there is an exact relation like this that you can easily derive by taking the time derivative of the, of the Friedman equation and using the equation of motion, you can prove that this is an exact relation. And then uh, this h dot is epsilon, and h dot is also phi dot squared, so this is the same as the Friedman equation. Okay, so this is a convenient form because, of course, from this I can take uh, time derivatives on both sides. And on this side, every time I take a time derivative, I'm going to use the chain rule and transform this as a d in d phi phi dot. And on the other hand, I'm really going to take the time derivative. And so I'm going to get time derivative of epsilon and of eta. So it is obvious that like this I can find the probably very long and complicated expression with all the possible derivatives of V on the one side and everything else on the other. Okay, it's just a matter of take another time derivative and this becomes the second derivative, the third derivative, and I can keep going. And just to give you an idea of what happens if you do that, suppose that I use this equation, I solve for d phi of V by putting phi dot on the other side, and I just compute it all. This is what I would find. And then I can, even more complicated, in fact, it's so complicated that I don't even want to write it all down. 
So I get this enormous equation that grow larger and larger as I go on. These are all exact equation. So there is an exact relation between Hubble's low roll parameters and potential low roll parameter. So at this point, it seems that I haven't gained anything. This expression seems much more complicated than the one I had before. But notice that as long as all of the Hubble's low roll parameters, so if I assume now that all of these uh, uh, Hubble's low roll parameters are much smaller than one, then this expression simplify dramatically. And in fact, they give me this nice expression. So under the assumption that those low roll parameters are small, or the Hubble's low roll parameters are small, then the Hubble's low roll parameters sorry, are given in terms of the potential one. And so this gives me a shortcut to compute them. So this is why they're useful, because now uh, these ones are easy. I just take the derivative of the potential, and then I can compute them. Okay, this, I think, is what the, 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 the purpose in life of the potential low roll parameter is. And there is nothing magic, there is an exact expression, and we are just approximating it. Uh, okay. This was just a little bit of algebra, and now I'm going to tell you how this is going to help us to find the solution of those equations of motion that I told you at the beginning, in general, are very hard to solve, this equation of motion. But I'm going to argue in a second that under the assumption that all of these Hubble's low roll parameters that I've introduced, as long as they are small, I will find some simple approximated solution of these equations. Questions? If not, yes. This is dimensionless because V is the same dimension as V, and here there is a 1 over phi, and M Planck takes care of that. So this is, this is dimensionless. So this is the first derivative of V with respect to phi. So it's dimension 3. And I squared it is 6 plus 2, 8. And downstairs I have V squared, which is dimension 4 times 2, 8. So it's dimensionless. Is that the question? And this is also the, all the factors of M Planck. In fact, some people leave them as an exercise. I'm going to try to write down all the factors of M Planck, but you can just fix them doing dimensional analysis. And so all of these things are dimensionless, and that's why I put the M Planck to the fourth here. Pretty much they count the number of derivatives. OK, so now I'm going to talk about yeah, some dynamics. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to introduce yet another little piece of notation, which I know is a little bit annoying. But it's going to make it so straightforward to generalize all of these uh, calculations to the multi-field case that I thought I should introduce it. So the other piece of notation is that I'm going to call the kinetic term x. This is just a definition. Um, on the background, Uh, this quantity is simply one half phi dot square. Okay, so that's kind of a, it's a nice uh, function to work with. Why is that? Well, it's the most natural function uh, to write down. Um, you probably remember that the energy density was one half 
phi dot squared plus V, so this is just X plus V, and the pressure was the same thing, minus V, so this is X minus V, and therefore the conservation of uh, energy momentum Uh, this is the conservation of the energy momentum tensor. You nicely see that the V cancel here. This is exactly what you expect from the cosmological constant. that doesn't get diluted with the expansion. Um, and of course, this gives you this equation. This equation, of course, has to be equivalent to the equation of motion of the field phi because uh, we know that the equation that we get from the conservation of the energy momentum tensor, they are not new things. They should be equivalent to the equations of motion. They are a consequence of general diffeomorphism invariance of the theory. And in fact, uh, you can easily check this by noticing that phi dot is just phi double dot times phi dot. And so this equation is nothing but phi dot times the equation of motion. So this one is the same as that, just multiply with a phi dot. It will become clear in a second that the notation is much easier and all the algebra is if I use these variables. Okay, so what we define epsilon to be minus h dot over h squared, and that's easily written as x over h squared, and therefore 3x over v plus x. So x is kinetic term, v is potential term, since I want this one to be much smaller than 1, the first thing that I discover is that the potential has to be much bigger than the kinetic term. That's kind of obvious from the Friedman equation. I want to be dominated by the potential part so that it looks like a cosmological constant. That's the first assumption. So I can drop this kinetic part here and only keep the potential at, at first order in this approximation. So in some sense, if you want, the usual solution for A of T is just E to the integral in DT of H. And if I can drop this phi dot, this is just given by the integral in DT of the square root of V over 3 and Planck square. In some sense, uh, this, this is telling me what the scale factor is. Very good. So this is actually the, 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 the trivial part. The more interesting one is the second slow roll equation. The definition is written up here. And you can show, I, I, can, I leave it as an exercise, how this is written in terms of the kinetic term. This is, this is the formula. So eta, in some sense, knows about the smallness of epsilon, but it also knows that the the kinetic term must not change fast as a function of time. So asking that eta is much smaller than 1 automatically tells me that x dot, since I already knew that epsilon is smaller than 1, it really tells me that this second term is smaller and therefore x dot is smaller than xh. This is very important because it tells me that one of these three terms appearing in the equation is negligible, namely the first one. That term is the acceleration term. So in single field, this statement of eta being small tells me that I can neglect the acceleration term. We will see in a second that's a peculiarity of single field inflation and is not a general statement. Okay, then the equation simplifies to 6h equals minus v prime phi dot or phi dot equals minus v phi over 3h. So there is more uh, about this equation than meets the eye, okay? So this is the final equation that we got by neglecting the acceleration term. And we got this remarkable, uh, remarkable equation, okay? There are at least three things that are remarkable about this. Perhaps the first thing is that it's a first order differential equation where we started from a second order one. So this approximate equation The first thing is that it is first order 
So in some sense, the assumption of being in the slow roll, of being in slow roll it means that we lose uh, the memory of one of the two initial conditions. If you have a second order differential equation, two initial condition, assuming that in slow roll, one of the two initial conditions disappeared. So that, that, that means that there is some kind of attractor tra trajectory in phase space that irrespective of where you start, you're going to end on the same trajectory. So that's the, f the first remarkable fact. Second remarkable fact is that the left-hand side knows about dynamics. Knows about if you want the solution, it, because it's phi dot. No, I need to have a solution to compute phi dot. While the right-hand side, no, it only knows about v of phi. That we said a priori doesn't know about the solution. Yes. Yes, completely independent. In fact, here I haven't mentioned slow roll, potential slow roll parameters ever. In fact, those are not useful concepts in general deriving the slow roll expansion. Yeah, I don't, I don't find them as useful. In some single field regimes, they are useful because they are so quick to compute, but I think they, they put you on the wrong mindset, especially when you generalize to two fields. And I'm going to show that specifically. So. Nowhere here I've ever used this potential thing. So yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, so this is the magic relation that happens in single field. Because of this slow roll expansion, things that know about the specific solution are somehow determined only by the properties of the potential. That was the magic that we were seeing here. Okay, this is just another way of saying the same thing. This does not happen when you have more than one field. Okay, so it's a very remarkable property of single field inflation. Um, Okay, finally, so of course one could now spend the next three lectures writing down different V of phi and computing all of these slow roll parameters, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I encourage you, if you are serious about learning uh, uh, about this, is just to play around with all kind of potential that you can come up with. Start with simpler ones, like these, and then maybe you can go crazy. Basically, what you discover is that there are potential like this, or potential like this, or some other ones, and all of these are v as a function of phi. And more or less, where they are either very flat or very high, those potentials support inflation, as described by these potentials in all parameters. I don't think I have too many interesting things to say about this, so just play around with it. And, and you convince yourself that this model actually can give you inflation, this one as well, actually pretty much any curve you, 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 you write down. Okay, so I'm going to let you play with it. I'm going to deal with slightly more uh, one more conceptual issue, which is how long does inflation has to have to go? We probably all have heard the number 60 usually coming up in this discussion, so it would be nice to know uh, just a, at least a quick way to get the number 60. So that's what I'm going to give you a long discussion to get 60 as a result. And of inflation. So when does inflation end? By definition, inflation ends well, when we stop the accelerated expansion, and that's the same as asking when epsilon becomes 1. Notice that this is Hubble epsilon, not, uh, not potential epsilon. I'm only using Hubble's slow roll parameters. Okay, that's, this is when it ends. So how can we count how long it is? Well, we use the same uh, number before. It's usually much, much more convenient to use n as a measure of time rather than t, even when you're solving this numerically on a computer, for example. For one thing, n is dimensionless, but also it doesn't change as crazily as t does. So it's much more easy numerically, and I think it's conceptually simpler. Well, we know what n is. We just said is the integral in d log a. And uh, we said this is the same as the integral in h dt, but we don't stop with this chain rule things. We're going to write d phi over phi dot. So d phi in d, sorry, uh, dt in d phi, d phi, which is equal h over phi dot in d phi. 
Okay, with chain rules, as long as you do background inflation, you can pretty much get anywhere. Um, so in principle, if you do this integral from some initial condition up to the phi for which epsilon is equal one, that's how long inflation lasted. So given a solution, you know what h is, what phi dot is, you can perform this integral. An approximated result, well, we can, now we go to these slow roll parameters, is uh, by approximating this h over phi dot with v over v prime, which you can just using the, this equation and the fact that v is much smaller than, much bigger than h. Then you get d phi here. Okay, so if you want to have an approximation of how long inflation goes, you can use this, this formula. How long do we need it to go? Um, so for that, I, ne I need to do a plot. The vertical axis will be commoving distances, commoving scales. One important commoving scale that we discuss in this class is the Hubble radius. And we said that the commoving Hubble radius is 1 over AH. And this is this line here. Another interesting scale, it might be a certain K that you're looking at. And this is, um, let's say, logarithm of a scale factor. So some measure, horizontal is some measure of time. As the Hubble radius is decreasing with time, that's where inflation is. And then later on is either radiation domination or matter domination. Eventually, these things comes back down, and you have dark energy, but we don't worry too much about that. Okay, so this is the, actually, this is the whole history of the universe somehow in one plot, so it's good to, to keep in mind how to do this picture. Okay, so let's consider a single mode. Let's suppose that I go in the sky or in last case structure, and I measure a mode of a certain physical length today, k. Well, that is the same as the moving uh, value of that field. So you can see that that was the same as the Hubble radius twice during the history of the universe, one recently, and that's when after it re-entered the Hubble radius, we measured it. Uh, but then it had been outside of the Hubble radius for a long time until it re-entered during inflation. Uh, good, so when it re-entered, by definition, it was equal to one over AH. So here it was equal to one over AH of K. And here, when it re-enters, let's say it re-enters today, so it's 1 over AH today, 0. And here, I'm going to call it this the end of inflation. So the Hubble radius there is 1 over AH end. Okay, now to tell you how long I need inflation to be, I'm going to compute the ratio of these two scales in two different ways. I'm going to compute it from the left side of the figure and from the from the right side of the figure and the left side of the figure. So I'm going to compute twice the same quantity, and then, of course, I impose them to be equal. Okay, so let me go how I do that. So the quantity I want to compute is K over A, H, and. So E stands for end of inflation. So I want to compute the, the ratio between the wavelength that I'm looking at and the Hubble radius at the end of inflation, I'm going to compute this first on the left-hand side. How would you compute it if you were on the left-hand side? Well, I know that on the left-hand side, k is the same as 1 over AHK, because at some point it had to re-enter the horizon. Um, sorry, this is 1 over k. Of course, because we are measuring uh, distances, so it's one over uh, wavelength. So this thing is A H at some moment K divided by H end of inflation. But during inflation, H is approximately constant, so I can simplify it out. So it's A of K over A end. And I'm going to say that this is exactly the N we want to compute. Sorry, it's E to the N, right? Because we said before that N is just the logarithm of a final divided by A initial. So I guess this is e to the minus n. That's nice. The first way of computing this gave me an expression that depends on n. So if I can evaluate the same quantity with an expression that doesn't depend on n, I know how, how long n has to be. 
But this was computation A. Then I do computation B. It's pretty much the same way, but I have to be a little bit clever. So again, I want to compute the same quantity. And again, I'm going to use the same trick that K, well, the, the, the denominator is the same. But upstairs, K, I'm going to evaluate it now when it re-enters. When it re-enters the Hubble radius, well, it's equal to the Hubble radius. And so K is equal to AH today. So that's what I put upstairs. Now, it's easy to know how AH evolves uh, in time because you get it from the, uh, from the Friedman equation. Friedman equation just tells you that AH goes like the square root of A squared times rho. So for really simplicity, let's imagine that the universe was radiation dominated for the whole time. Then this is just 1 over A because rho radiation goes like 1 over A to the fourth. This is the simplest possible thing you can do. If you want to do something more elaborate, just put it on mathematics and you can, you can. It just becomes cumbersome. Okay, well, we found that AH goes like 1 over A. So this is simply a n over eight, uh, a zero. We need some way to compute the, this basically tells me how many e-folding there has been of hot Big Bang universe. And I want those e-foldings to be the same as the e-foldings of inflation. And then I, I equate them. Well, this is simple to equate because it's, it's the energy density today divided by the energy density at the end of inflation to the power one quarter, because rho goes like one over a to the fourth. Okay, so that's pretty much done. I'm going, now I just do a equals b. Uh, I know what is the energy density today. I don't know what is the one at the end of inflation. So I'm going to write the result in which n depends on the energy density of the end of inflation. And that formula is this. N is equal 63 plus the log of the energy density at the end of inflation divided by some typical number. Actually, typically, rho at the end of inflation has to be lower than this, so the number of e folding will be a little bit lower than 63, but that's where you get the number 60 from. Okay, so I know that there was a little bit of algebra in this, but I think it's, it's good that you have one toy model in which you're able to compute where the number 60 comes from. So just forget about that kind of energy matter domination. Just do it as simple as possible. And this is relatively simple algebra. So this is why we need 60 foldings of inflation. Perhaps a little bit less if inflation is low scale, so it reheats at some lower energies. So maybe as low as uh, when people do this uh, in a more, uh, in more precise way, people find that maybe you can go as low as uh, 25 and probably as high as 65, but not, not very different. It is customary to take n equals 60 when people compare results, but probably 50 would be a more appropriate number. Okay, any questions about, yes? Yes. I mean, fixed as much as that range, you would call it fixed. It varies by a factor of two between 30 and 60. But yeah, yeah that doesn't matter so much. It mostly depends on, uh, because on the left-hand side of this plot, the, for the calculation of A, the only thing I used was that inflation is quasi the sitter. And so H is constant. So any dynamics that you have which is quasi the sitter is going to give the same result on this side. And on this side, it's just going to depend on what you assume about the Big Bang history. So in that sense, I think this is a neat way of, of separating the, the physical dependencies. OK, maybe some other questions. I know that was a, little, a lot of algebra, maybe a bit fast, but yes. Upper limit. Well, yeah, I showed you that uh, 
well, in this simple-minded uh, universe in which is all radiation after some time. Oh, this is, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I should have made this clear. This is the number of E-foldings corresponding to a mode that we observe today. It could be that inflation in the past was going on for another billion uh, E-foldings. Absolutely, yeah. We don't see that, though, but the number of E-foldings that we get to see, yeah, that, that was the number. Very good point, yeah. In principle, inflation actually could go down forever in the past. We just never get to see that. But this is the, the, one, the one we get. But infinitely, I guess, in number of e-foldings. <laughs> Very good, yeah. So, some other question? Uh, so then I'm going to spend uh, 15 minutes discussing multi-fields. So this thing is already complicated enough. Why, why do I need to make it more complicated? Why, why should I care about multi-field? Um, well, things should be as simple as possible, but not any simpler. So I'm going to give you some reason why. You might care about multi-field, and then you make up your mind. On the very general side, just consider renormalization group it tells you that there are more degrees of freedom <coughs> at higher energies. <coughs> so it's unclear why there should be only one scalar field during inflation. Okay, well, it's a very general argument. Uh, a slightly more detailed argument is that try to build inflation in any UV complete theory of gravity uh, theory, for example, and in fact, pretty much the only example in string theory, then you get the number of fields is very, very large, typically of order 100 to 1,000, and that is in fact associated to the moduli. In fact, in any extra dimensional theory, extra dimensional theory, you have a lot of uh, scalar fields that corresponds to the, uh, to the deformation of the compact uh, dimensions. So even if you have a five dimensional theory, for example, if you take a theory which is Minkowski four times, um, times a circle, then you will have in four dimension effective action, you will have a scalar field which is represented by the 0 kk mode of the metric in the fifth dimension. And inflation and string, sorry, string compactification are just a, uh, a glorified, complicated example of this simple behavior. So that's another reason why you do expect more than one field. Perhaps slightly more to the point, uh, there are two things uh, in which single field inflation is very unique. And so it seems that you're really looking under a lamppost. There are some accidental symmetries about one-dimensional manifolds that you don't want to be dominated by. First thing is that a one-dimensional manifold is always flat. Okay, that's a kind of a fun statement. Basically, it, become, it comes about because, uh, um, because of the symmetries of the Riemann tensor in one dimension. It's... Well, you can convince yourself that it has to be anti-symmetric and you do all the games, so you cannot write any component that is non-zero. So one dimension is always uh, flat. That means that the kinetic term is always canonical. I can always do a transformation of what I called phi. I can think of phi as parametrizing a one-dimensional uh, field space, the target space. And up to changing phi into some phi prime, I can always take this, this, scalar, uh, this kinetic term to be canonical. So, so here I didn't multiply times some complicated function of phi. I could in principle, but I can always go from phi to phi prime and get rid of this function, always in one dimension, because one-dimensional manifolds are always flat. Yes, here I'm assuming a smooth manifold, and for smooth manifolds you can do it. Huh? 
yeah, if you have some, uh, some singularity somewhere in the target space, it gets complicated. But here I'm assuming one to one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the transformation, you should be able to do it. Uh, I mean, this is a covariant tensor. So if it is zero in one set of coordinates, it's zero in every set of coordinates. So. OK, so this is one fact that is very peculiar of single field. So you might wonder what happens to multi-field. And, and we will see it in a second. Uh, and the last thing is that uh, there is no sense in which uh, potential slow roll parameters, they don't exist. No potential slow roll parameter, generally. And maybe this is the, the last reason why I want to make this point. Maybe some couple of you in the, in the rest of your life will write a paper about multi-field, so at least you know yeah, what is the story with zero roll parameters. OK, so we're going to do something very simple to what we did before. That's why I left all of these equations on the board. Now we're going to assume that um, uh, phi, instead of being a, a, well, a single field, we're going to upgrade it to a vector in some uh, in some uh, n-dimensional target manifold, for example, just Rn, or for example, something more complicated. So then this kinetic term uh, should be improved to uh, include for the metric uh, of this manifold. So this is, is a generic function of uh, phi vector. This is the one thing that we didn't have in single field. So this, this formula changes slightly. Where now the i's are contracted using this capital G. So besides using this trick, every other formula that I've written on the board pretty much is gonna be, remain true. That's why I think it's very easy to, to, to do this, and I'm gonna try to do it, and I think it's interesting to see what the result is. So up to putting these indices, most formula remain true. And it is again true. Um, I have to tell you what the, the equation of motion is also very sim similar to this, with just two exceptions. One exception is that the, the, the second derivative is substituted with this directional covariant derivative, and then I have to put little indices i everywhere. And then again here I can just call it x, so I'm done. So these are the equations of motion in the general case. I haven't told you what this D is. All of this remains true. So I have to tell you what D is. DT of phi dot i is equal phi double dot i. So this, now the second derivative is a little bit more complicated because I want to make it covariant under change of coordinates in the target manifold. So it gets this capital gamma, where this gamma now is the Christoffel symbol of this, uh, of this metric. So upon using this, uh, these tricks, the equation of motion looks formally the same as before. But w what I wanted to appreciate is that there is an interesting new player that before was forbidden is that there is a new force that, that plays a role in this equation, which is not the Hubble friction, it's not the force coming from the potential, it's the force coming from the fact that the manifold is curved. That's usually what we call gravity, you know, the fact that the manifold is curved and you move. Uh, in this case, it is the target manifold of being curved, so this is in some sense the target manifold of uh, gravity, but it's just a new element that was forbidden before. So you might find interesting dynamics by by looking at this system. And notice that all of these formula are both general covariant under space-time changes, but also under phi changes in the target space. So that, that's why they're, they're cute. All of these equations are the same as before. x plus v, x minus v, where x now is the upgraded x. And again, I want to consider inflation, so epsilon has to be much smaller than one. Notice the beauty of using Hubble's Laurel parameters doesn't care if I have 10 million fields. It's the same equation because it only knows about the geometry. <laughs>
And the same for epsilon. This also doesn't care. Uh, so it's still much smaller than one. Same, same. Okay, so all of these equations are the same. Okay, so sometimes people write down, I just want to say, sometimes people write down these incorrect equations. And they say this is, uh, as long as this is small, you can do inflation. So this would be pretty much the analogous of what we were doing before by just putting indices. This is not a necessary condition. Sometimes people define the Hubble, the second one, to be the minimal eigenvalue of Vij divided by V. We have a Planck square. This is neither necessary nor sufficient. Both of them are not great things to use. Uh, so I just thought they're not, not good things. Uh, okay, let's derive the right one. Well, pretty much is all written here. Okay, this is still true. Epsilon is still this quantity, which is still x, h over x squared. So this is still true. So again, v is much bigger than x. Again, we need to be dominated by the potential term. Yes. Very good. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's important. So now I have to contract them. In fact, all of this formula, you can just guess how they become covariant just by putting indices and, and asking that they, look, that they look okay. Okay, so very good. Eta, same formula, also doesn't change. This is the same formula as before. And again, I can say that x, x dot is much smaller than uh, xh because it's the same formula. Now, what happens is that before we could conclude, we could find a solution for phi dot. This was the big step. And I, I kind of spent some time saying how remarkable was this relation. As you imagine, this relation now doesn't hold anymore. This relation does. So I can neglect this x dot term. Let's write what x dot is. x dot is equal to phi dot i. This is a, it's not just the acceleration that is small, but it's the projection of the acceleration along the direction we are moving. That is the quantity that has to be small. You can move as fast as you want and as accelerated as you want, as long as you accelerate in a direction perpendicular to the direction in which you're moving. For example, if you move on a circle, this term is always zero because the acceleration is always perpendicular to the velocity. Okay, uh, well, that's pretty much uh, the final. There are a couple of algebraic steps. You can use this equation to find a solution which is valid in slow roll for x. x is just the other thing. And, uh, and that gives you the correct uh, the correct slow roll uh, approximation, which now I'm assuming I'm neglecting some higher order things, which is very similar to that one, but differently in an in interesting way. Cosine theta, where cosine theta is defined to be uh, the angle between the gradient and the direction in which you're moving. Very intuitively, if you're going down a ski slope and you're skiing perpendicular to the gradient, your altitude is not changing. So the cosmological constant is not changing and so you're really inflating, no matter how fast you go. Well, with some limit. But so in this sense, in multi-field, the right concept is really slow descend. It's asking how much do you descend rather than slow roll. Okay, you can be moving fast as long as you go perpendicular. So that means that even if the potential is steep, as long as you're moving perpendicular to the potential, you can still be inflating. Of course, if you in impose that cos theta is one, then you recover, for example, single field equation. 
but this is not, not mandatory. And just for completeness, let me mention what is the other approximation that you could try to call eta v. It's uh, unfortunately more, slightly more complicated equation. Okay, so these are the correct, uh, the correct approximation for the Hubble potentials in multi-field. So I think that there is a large uh, chunk of multi-field uh, inflation that no one has ever really explored. Many no-go theorem in, uh, in string theory are just based on epsilon without this cosine being small. So perhaps should be, should be at least revised. Okay, so I leave, I leave that for the, for the future generations to, to think about. And in the next, uh, yes. Very good, yes. No. Uh, well, I mean, th this would be Goldstein bosons if I didn't have the potential term, right? The potential is, is breaking all of those uh, shift symmetries. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the current approach is to ways. Either you really try to construct it in a specific theory like uh, string theory, and then let's say you're describing a D3 brain, which is a point like in a compact space like a Calabi-Yau, which is not flat. It's richly flat, but not flat. Then a kinetic term will have those kind of uh, geometric factors. We will feel about the target space geometry. So that's a simple case. Whether you ask me whether it generically appears one way or another, yeah, it's hard to tell. I agree with you that you cannot get it uh, from an exact Goldstone boson because you need a potential, otherwise nothing happens. In fact, it's a really cool exercise. Take an exact um, uh, nonlinear sigma model, I compute epsilon. It's three, irrespective of the geometry. For any nonsigma sigma model in any number of target space dimension, epsilon is three. I was actually shocked by this fact. That I think it's true. So, okay, yeah, so that's, but if you put the potential, uh, no. Then if you put the potential, things change. So that, that's a good comment. <laughs> okay, so the next 15 minutes, we're going to introduce the notation that we will use to finally compute the nicest story of, of all of this is how quantum uh, perturbations in the early universe generate uh, what we observe today. How, how did that come about? Well, you kind of know the story. They got uh, expanded and blown to cosmological scales, and the amplitude is set by the uncertainty principle. So that's the calculation we want to do. To do the calculation, we need to do a few fun things. One is that we will consider Q of t in curved space. Time. And we're going to do it in the simplest possible, algebraically simplest possible context. So GR plus a scalar field. So we're really after kind of the, the idea rather than, than the complicated calculation. So to do this, we clearly have to go beyond the homogeneous background. No? So we're going to go beyond uh, the uh, what? homogeneous and isotropic background. So was all of this discussing, discussion of the background useless? No, it was not, because the background determines uh, the symmetries obeyed by the action for the perturbation. Okay, that's kind of a general lesson in physics. Once you solve the background, and that has some symmetries, for example, homogeneity and isotropy, and maybe some more, those are the symmetries of the action for the perturbations. And it's going to be much easier to compute uh, correlators of perturbations if we have some symmetries lying around. Okay, symmetry number one, homogeneity. What does this uh, tell us? Tell us that it is a good idea to work in Fourier space. Because uh, two different modes, uh, well, let's say phi, for example, phi of k. Oh, sorry, let me introduce this notation. I'm going to call perturbation to phi. I'm going to call them curly phi. I don't have to write delta phi all the time, which takes me twice as long. So I'm going to use this curly phi for perturbations and this other phi here uh, for the background. 
So perturbations with one Fourier mode are un, um, in, completely independent from perturbations with a different one, okay, different from k prime, at linear order. Perhaps in some sense this is the reason why we're all here today. No, it's, it's very easy to do cosmological perturbation theory because different k is decoupled and all of the transfer function for CMB and large scale structure are just one function of k. Pretty easy. Otherwise, it would have been very hard to, to solve this problem. And in fact, people in large scale structure, that's what they are trying to, to do, push beyond the linear order, and that's, that's tough. Okay, so that's simplification number one. So you can always think of superposition principle. You take the universe homogeneous with one wave, find the result, and then sum up over all possible waves. And that's the correct result. That's much, much simpler. Point number two, isotropy. What, that, what does that tell us? It tells us the very useful factor of scalar vector tensor decomposition. Uh, scalar vector tensor, well, you can decompose it, and after you decompose it, the scalar vector and tensor are independent of each other at linear order. S, V, and T, independent, again, at linear order. Makes it even easier, and I'll discuss in a second why this is easier. Both of these properties, while well, you can f figure them out in a little bit more formal way, the way I think about them, which is clearly very sketchy, but is try to write down a way because there is no way that you can make two different case couple or a scalar, a scalar coupled to a vector or coupled to a tensor. So my, my proof would be by exhaustion. So try to write down an equation with k. You can try to put derivatives in Fourier space. Those are just multiplications. Uh, well, let's write it in real space. But you're not allowed to write a random function of x. That, that you're not allowed because uh, the background is isotropic. So this would break, sorry, homogeneity. And the same thing, you're not allowed to write down something squared. So this would be nonlinear. This could be a very sketchy form of an equation. When you do the Fourier transform, clearly this is phi of k. And this is k times phi of k, with the same k appearing in both of them. And the only case in which you get something interesting is when either you break the homogeneity of the background, or um, uh, or you go nonlinear. Probably obvious to all of you, but I think it's, it's good to keep in mind uh, what's what's ba the basic reason. It's just there is nothing I can write down to make k and k prime couple, except for these two things that I explicitly said are forbidden. This is perhaps the, the most intuitive way. OK, so let's do this uh, scalar vector tensor decomposition in this uh, mono, monochromatic universe. Monochromatic because I can, only cons I can consider waves one at a time. Uh, as an example, I'm going to give you uh, uh, a scalar vector tensor decomposition of the metric. So G mu nu will be some background G mu nu. This will be some FLRW metric. And I think you did a little bit of cosmological perturbation theory uh, uh, when you studied dark energy with Koyama. So I'm going to do it a little bit faster, perhaps. If you have, but I'm going to use the notation of scalar fields. So if you, yeah, if you cannot follow, please, uh, please tell me. So this is, I'm going to call H the perturbations to the metric. So, uh, how many degrees of uh, many degrees of freedom there are in this H in principle? Ten. Very good. So this has ten things. So that would be a hell of a job huh? to work with all of those ten coupled differential equation, partial even. Ah, maybe I should have said this means that the partial differential equation becomes ordinary differential equation. That, that's why it's cool. Um, OK, 10. But we're going to see uh, what those 10 are. So in particular, H0, 0, 
Um, doesn't transform under rotations. Well, it transforms like a scalar, so only its argument transform. So when I say scalar vector tensor decomposition, I mean with respect to spatial rotations. This should not be confused to scalar vector tensor with respect to general diffeomorphism, which is not what I'm talking about in this specific discussion. So the zero zero component is clearly a scalar under spatial rotation because well, it doesn't have an I index. The H0I component, I can decompose it into two things, up to a, uh, a conventional factor of A in front. And here I'm using uh, the notation from Weinberg's cosmology group book. I decompose it into two things, where one is a vector and one is the derivative of a scalar. And this makes sense as long as that uh, vector is... Um, Transverse. Finally, the IJ part, that's the most complicated one. Can you see here? The IJ part. has another scalar A, another scalar B. So let's uh, summarize all the scalars. They are A, B, E, and F. So that's four of them. There is another, um, another transverse, transverse vector here. So DI, CI equals zero. So there are two vectors, CI and GI. Each one have two polarization, plus and minus one. So this gives me, gives me oh, I'm sorry, two times two, so four. Uh, for components. And finally, there is a, a tensor one. This one you know very well because you know about gravitational waves. This is the graviton. This is transverse traceless. And so DII is equal DI DIJ equals zero. And so we have one tensor. Transverse traceless, only polarization plus two and minus two. So this is two degrees of freedom, total 10. Good. So we got the right counting. The isotropy of the background, what it allows us to do is to throw away these. Well, we would have been able to throw them away anyways because they decay at linear order. And we can also disregard the tensor as long as we talk about the scalars and vice versa. Disregard the scalar as long as we talk about the tensor because these things do not talk to each other. Um, okay, the last piece of thing that you need to actually do a calculation is a trick to get rid of yet two more of these two scalars. And you probably know that the way you do that, in fact, that's, that's really necessary, is, uh, is gauge transformations, so uh, coordinate transformations. What does a gauge transformation look like? Well, you go from one variable to another one, and they can differ by an arbitrary function of this uh, variable. This is the most, sorry, this is the most generic uh, change of coordinates that I can do. And I'm gonna work, instead of using change of coordinates, which is a passive way of thinking about this, I'm gonna use an, an active way and think that every change of coordinates rather is a gauge transformation of the field. So I'm gonna define the gauge transformation of a scalar field, for example, to be its value with the new coordinate, sorry, its new value minus its old value evaluated on the same point. That's very important. Okay, well, we know very well how a, a scalar field transform is x pri phi prime x prime equals phi of x. So I can just use that into this equation. And you will see that it is equal minus the lead derivative in the xi direction of the field phi. If you're not so uh, used to lead derivatives, well, this is nothing but xi mu d mu phi. Ah, sorry, d mu phi. And since uh, we're going to treat this uh, 
transformation as a linear uh, quantity in perturbations. At linear order, the thing that will appear here is psi mu d mu phi, where this is the background. Since the background only depends on time, this is just minus uh, psi uh, zero phi dot. Okay, this is how a scalar field transform under a general change of coordinates. And this formalism is powerful because uh, with lead derivatives, because then it's very easy to know how the metric transforms. Well, it's minus the lead derivative of this uh, of the metric. And the lead derivative of the metric is probably familiar to you from discussing uh, isometries, and you know that it's just the killing equation, right? So this is just minus. So this is the, the transformation of the metric. Okay, I just need one equation and then I'm done. Sorry about going a little bit long. This psi nu, we can write it under scalar vector tensor decomposition as a zero component, a di component of a scalar part plus a transverse component. Okay, there are four of these, four functions. One function here, another here, and two here. Notice that two of these functions, the scalar part and the zero part, they all transform as a scalar. So I can use them, since they are arbitrary, to get rid of two of the scalars that I had down there. So minus two scalars. So this has made my life so much easier without having to do a single calculation and down to just three scalars. And next time, actually, we will discuss is only one that we really need to take care of of and quantize. So this is probably a good time to stop and ask you if you have any questions. I know it was a little bit of a long lecture and and it's getting late, so we're all tired, but yeah. Could you please repeat uh, why you have two degrees of freedom in the tensor part? Uh, yes, because uh, this is a three times three matrix, uh, symmetric, uh, so it's six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I lose uh, one here because it's traceless, and three here because it's transverse. So it's uh, six minus one minus three, and that's, that's the two. And those are really the two polarization, uh, the cross uh, um, and, the, and the plus polarization of the graviton. And I think Michele tomorrow probably will do a little bit of theory, since he will do gravitational waves, about this, these two things. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Sorry? Very good. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, do you need some special properties about the G? IEA and multi-field inflation? Yes, good question. It has to be positive definite because I want to avoid ghosts. If there was one negative definite, I could uh, you know, diagonalize it there and I would have a ghost. So I would like it to have it be positive definite and for the rest, you know, smooth. Yeah. Symmetric? Well, it has to be symmetric, yes. No. Well, any anti-symmetric part is going gonna, is gonna to drop because I'm contracting it with uh, something which is symmetric. So yeah, it's only the symmetric part that is relevant. Is there any use in, in proposing, instead of a multiplet of scalar fields, like something else, like spinors or something a little bit more elaborate? Or? Yes. So typically things that, that are not scalar, when they if, if they're allowed to get an expectation value and they get it, they usually bre break isotropy. Think about the vector, it's gonna point somewhere. That's annoying because the universe we see is isotropic. So then you can uh, either do some smart tricks to get rid of that anisotropies uh, by gauging it somehow and introducing some internal symmetries, but that's maybe more advanced. Uh, the other thing is that you can put a bunch of them and make them point in random direction. And if you put, uh, 
I don't know, 10 to the 10 of them, the square root of that, 10 to the 5 is maybe the level at which we prove isotropy. So those are, people have investigated those possibilities. It doesn't feel as, uh, as natural. And especially it doesn't feel natural from this effective field theory point of view. You're really just giving a clock to the cosmological constant. So it's unclear why a clock gives you a different time when you look at it from, a, from another rotation. It kind of be a scale. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Enrico. <laughs>